AI for Full Self Driving by Andre Karpathy. The original one is 30 minutes, highly suggest you watch it, link in the description below. This video is the condensed down version, under 10 minutes. Leave a comment down below, let me know what you think. Do subscribe for the latest and greatest Tesla content, and most importantly, thanks for watching, and I will see you guys next time. So I'm very excited to be here to tell you a bit more about how we're scaling machine learning models uh, data algorithms and infrastructure at Tesla and what that looks like. We've now uh, sort of accumulated almost 3 billion miles on the autopilot, which sounds like a lot. Uh, we then have more advanced features, uh, like such as, for example, navigating autopilot. This allows you to set a pin somewhere in the world as a destination, and then as long as you stick to the highway system, the car will automatically reach that destination. We've also late last year released a smart summon. This allows you to, with your phone on the mobile app, uh, summon the car to you from a parking spot. What are we talking about here? Pedestrian A, B is the following. Here's a simple, here's one example. Um, the car just, oh, someone just emerges from in between parked cars. And this car may not have even been on the autopilot, but we continuously monitor the environment around us. We saw that there was a person in front and we slam on the brakes automatically. Uh, here's another example. Looks like a pretty benign scene. This person is probably not paying attention. The pedestrian is not paying attention. We slam on the brakes and prevent a collision. Now the goal of the team, however, is to produce full self-driving functionality. It comes to an intersection. It waits for a uh, yeah, green traffic light. It turns to the left. Uh, merges on the highway and no need to touch the wheel. Uh, these, this is not available to the customers. We only have developer builds that do these turns through intersections and so on, but uh, we're trying to get it to the point where we feel uh, that the system is accurate enough to actually release in some form. The Waymo, I just took a small clip. Uh, a Waymo comes to an intersection and uh, takes a left through the intersection. You've seen this for a decade. So how is this special? Why are we so late? What's taking so long? And so everyone else has a LiDAR on the top of the car the LiDAR shoots out lasers and uh, creates a LiDAR uh, kind of point cloud map. And then you pre-map the environment that you're going to drive. So you have a high definition LiDAR map and you localize to it to a centimeter level accuracy. And then you know exactly the path you're going to take so you can just steer to keep yourself you know, perfectly localized in the correct uh, region. Um, so this is quite helpful, but this is not the approach that we take. When we come to an intersection, we encounter it basically for the first time. We come to an intersection, how many lanes are there? Left, right, center? Uh, which way should I turn, what are the traffic lights, which lanes do they control, all of this is just done just from camera feed, uh, camera vision uh, alone. So here's a random scene um, where we have to potentially drive and wind our way through this uh, scene. As a human, this is relatively effortless, uh, but you're actually doing a lot under the hood and the autopilot has to as well. So we have to understand a lot about what are the static objects, what are the dynamic objects, uh, where are the, what is the road layout. Uh, and uh, the detection of these tasks serves two purposes and two customers. Number one, we actually need it for the driving policy. And number two, we actually want to show a lot of things on the instrument cluster for the human so that they gain um, sort of confidence in the system. Here we've produced a video that shows some of the under the hood predictions for <clears throat> the main camera that is facing forward on the car. And you see that we're detecting lanes, we're detecting stop sign over there, stop line, road markings, we're putting cuboids around cars, traffic lights, road edges and curbs. Uh, even things like trash bins coming up over there. Uh, lines that make up the intersection. In a bit, there's lines that create parking spots. We have to have all these attributes for whether or not a line is for a parking spot or not, and things like that. So even taking a very simple task, like for example, stop sign, you think that you know, neural networks are capable of handling thousands of categories of ImageNet with all of their variations and so on. So how difficult is it to just detect a fixed pattern of like red on white stop? Uh, and it actually gets quite difficult when you get to the long tail of it, even to create a simple detector for a stop sign. So first of all, stop signs can, of course, be in lots of very environmental conditions. Stop signs can not just be on poles, but kind of just like on walls. Stop signs can be temporary and just hang out uh, in different uh, configurations. Stop signs can have funny lights on them, uh, which uh, are supposed to make it easier to see the stop sign, but for our system, it's the opposite, active state or an active state. Stop signs can be on like uh, these cones. Stop signs can be heavily occluded in lots of ways by foliage, by signs. Stop signs can be occluded by cars. Basically, there's a massive variety of even just for a stop sign to get this to work. And what we do day to day in the team is we are going through the long tail and we're building all this infrastructure for sourcing all of these additional examples. The data engine, the process by which we um, iteratively apply active learning to source examples in cases where uh, the detector is misbehaving, and then we source examples in those, and we label them and incorporate them into part of a training set. So for stop sign detection, as an example, we have a uh, approximate detector for stop signs based on an initial seed set of data, 
and we run that and deploy that to cars in shadow mode. And then you can detect some kind of a lack of health of that detector at test time. So for example, the stop sign detection is flickering. That could be a, a source of in, um, sort of um, uh, uncertainty. We've struggled with these heavily occluded stop signs. We found that the detector was not performing very well when they were heavily occluded. And then we have a mechanism in this data engine process where we can actually train these kinds of detectors offline. So we can train a small detector that detects an occluded stop sign by trees. And then what we do with that detector is that we can beam it down to the fleet and we can ask the fleet, please apply this detector on top of everything else you're doing. And if the, this detector scores high, then please send us an image. And then the fleet responds with a somewhat noisy set, but they boost the amount of examples we have of stop signs that are occluded. And maybe 10% of them are actual occluded stop signs that we get from that stream. And this requires no firmware upgrade. This is completely dynamic and can just be done by the team extremely quickly. Is the bread and butter of how we actually get any of these tasks to work. It's just accumulating these large data sets in the full tail of that distribution. So what we end up doing is we have these neural networks that have a shared backbone, and then they're multitask uh, juggling uh, lots of different tasks. Um, and in total, the team is currently maintaining 48 uh, networks uh, that make 1,000 distinct predictions. Uh, these are just the raw number of output tensors. If you just take all of our networks and you add up the output tensors, it's 1,000. And those tensors, of course, can have multiple predictions in them. Uh, none of these predictions can ever regress, and all of them must improve over time. And uh, this takes 70,000 GPU hours to train all the neural nets. Uh, if you have a node with eight GPUs, you will be training for a year. So it, you know, we do quite a bit of training there. And all of this is not maintained by hundreds of people. All of this is maintained by a small elite team of Tesla AI people, of basically like a few dozen. So as an example, we're working with caution lights recently. We're trying to detect when the police car uh, lights are turned on. This is an example of a new task that we'd like to know about. And we sort of have a approach to, we know exactly what it takes to get a task to work. All the infrastructure is in place. So this task, we're going to treat it as a landmark task Landmark is an example of a prototype. So we have a detection prototype, a segmentation prototype, a landmark prototype. And these are just classes of tasks. And if your new task is a um, member of any of these, um, or an instance of any of these prototype classes, then all of the infrastructure is just plug and play and goes through the full data engine. You can collect the seed data set, you label your examples, you source more examples in the cases where you're failing, you deploy it to shadow, uh, in shadow mode, you source examples and you grind up metrics, you create all the unit test predicates. All this is completely automated and this, uh, we're mostly developing the automation infrastructure, and then it's easy to develop any new task, and that's kind of how we get this to work. So what I've explained so far is you take an image from one of the cameras, you run it through this shared backbone, and you make lots of predictions about it in the image pixel space. So here's a video, and I'm showing the predictions of the road edge task on all of the different cameras. And you can see that this is basically a binary segmentation problem uh, for us. Um, and we detect those edges here. So the raw detections, we project them out into 3D and we stitch them up into what we call a occupancy tracker. So this occupancy tracker uh, takes all the raw measurements from the 2D images, we project them out into the world and we stitch them up across cameras and we stitch them up across time. So the occupancy tracker is keeping the temporal context of that and it creates a small local map and then it winds its way through this parking lot to get to the person who is summoning the car at this time. And uh, roughly you can think of two code bases hidden inside the software stack. We have what I refer to as a software 1.0 code, which is good old fashioned C++, explicitly designed, uh, engineered by a person, a person writes the code. And then you have what I call software 2.0 code, where the, the code is an outcome of an optimization. It's, a, it's the compilation, it's a compiler takes your data set and creates neural network code that runs in the car. So over time, since I joined about two and a half years ago, the neural nets have expanded in how much of software 1.0 and they've taken over. And so the trend is upwards. So in particular, in the case of these road edges, as I've described, um, what we're now working towards is that we don't actually want to go through this explicit occupancy tracker, software 1.0 code. We'd like to engulf it into neural net code. And we see that typically that works really well. So here's an example in top row, I'm showing the uh, left camera center right. And I'm showing road edge detections in red. On the bottom row, on the left, you see the ground truth of what this intersection looks like. And you see that the car is positioned on the dot. And so that's the ground truth. On the very right, you see what happens when you take 2D predictions in the images and you cast them out. You basically get garbage. Like it somewhat works around the car. Their the projection is easy. But far away, especially near the horizon line, a few pixels of error means lots of meters of, the, of error. We take a pseudo LIDAR approach where you basically uh, um, 
predict the depth for every single pixel, and you can cast out your pixels, and you basically simulate LiDAR input that way, but it's purely from vision. And then you can use a lot of techniques that have been developed in, in also for LiDAR processing to actually achieve 3D object detection. Because we have huge data sets of people driving cars. So when people drive cars and they steer the wheel, they're actually data labeling for you. They're showing you how to drive through any, inter, uh, any intersection or any other uh, kind of place. And really looking into some of these self-surprise techniques to speed up the process uh, and to speed up the rate at which we learn from very little supervised data. So we don't have to collect like tens, hundreds of thousands of examples of accept, write, turn. Uh, we can do it, we prefer not to. <laughs>